Section four of Popular Tales from the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Yu. Popular Tales from the North by George Descent. Section four. Introduction. Part two. Diffusion. This general affinity established, we proceed to narrow our subject to its proper limits, and to confine it to the consideration first of popular tales in general, and secondly of those Norse tales in particular, which form the bulk of this volume. In the first place, then. The fact which we remarked of setting out that the groundwork or plot of many of these tales is common to all the nations of Europe is more important and of greater scientific interest than might at first appear. They form, in fact, another link in the chain of evidence of a common origin between the East and the West. And even the obstinate adherents of the old classical theory, according to which all resemblances were set down to sheer copying from Greek or Latin patterns, are now forced to confess not only that there was no such wholesale copying at all, but that in many cases the despised vernacular tongues have preserved the common traditions. Far more faithfully than the writers of Greece and Rome, the sooner, in short, that this theory of copying, which some, even besides the classicists, have maintained, is abandoned, the better not only for the truth, but for the literary reputation of those who put it forth. No one can, of course. Imagine that during that long succession of ages, when this mighty wedge of Aryan migration was driving its way through that prehistoric race, that nameless nationality, the traces of which we everywhere find underlying the intruders in the monuments and implements of bone and stone, a race akin, in all probability, to the Mongolian family, and whose miserable remnants we see pushed aside and huddled up in the holes and the corners of Europe as Lapps and Finns and Basques. No one, we say, can suppose for a moment that in that long process of contact and absorption, some traditions of earlier race should not have been caught up and adopted by the other. We know it to be a fact with, with regard to their language, from the evidence of philosophy, which cannot lie, and the witness borne by such a word as the Gothic "atta" for father, where a Mongolian has been adopted in preference to an Aryan word, is irresistible on that point. But that, apart from such natural assimilation, all the thousand shades of resemblance. And affinity, which gleam and flicker through the whole body of popular tradition in the Aryan race, as the aurora plays and flashes in countless rays athwart the northern heaven, should be the result of mere servile copying of one tribe's tradition by another, is a supposition as absurd as that of those good. Country folk who, when they see an aurora, fancy it must be a great fire, the work of some incendiary, and send off the parish engine to put it out. Not when we find in such a story as the master thief traits, which are to be found in the Sanskrit Hitopadesa, and which. Reminds us at once of the story of Ramsinitus in Herodotus, which are also to be found in German, Italian, and Flemish popular tales, but told 
in all with such a variation of character and detail and such adaptations to time and place as evidently show the original working of the national consciousness upon a stock of tradition common to all the race but belonging to no tribe of that race in particular and when we find this occurring not in one tale but in twenty we are forced to abandon the theory of such universal copying for fear lest we should fall into a greater difficulty than that for which we were striving to account to set this question in a plainer light let us take a well-known instance let let us take the story of william tell and his daring shot which is said to have been made in the year thirteen o seven it is just possible that the feat might be historical and no doubt thousands believe it for the sake of the swiss patriot as firmly as they believe in anything but unfortunately this story of the bold archer who saves his life by shooting an apple from the head of his child at the command of a tyrant is common to the whole aryan race it appears in saxo grammaticus who flourished in the twelfth century where it is told of panatoki king harold gomson's thane and assassin in the thirteenth century the wilkina saga relates it of eagle volunes our wayland smith's younger brother so also in the norse saga of st olaf king and martyr the king who died in ten thirty eager for the conversation of one of his heathen chiefs andridi competes with him in various athletic exercises first in swimming and then in archery after several famous shots on either side the king challenges andridi to shoot a tablet off his son's head without hurting the child andridi is ready but declares he will revenge himself in the child if the child is hurt the king has the first shot and his arrow strikes close to the tablet then andridi is to shoot but at the players of his mother and sister refuses the shot and has to yield and be converted so also king harold sigurdarson who died in ten sixty six backed himself against a famous marksman hemminger and ordered him to shoot a hazelnut off the heads of his brother born and hemminger performed the feat in the middle of the fourteenth century the malus maleficarum refers it to puncher a magician of the upper rhine here in england we have it in the old english ballad of adam bell klim of the clow and william of cloudlessly where william performs the feat it is not at all of tell in switzerland before the year fourteen ninety nine and the earlier swiss chronicles omitted altogether it is common to the turks and the mongolians and a legend of the wild samoyeds who never heard of tell or saw a book in their lives relates a chapter and verse of one of the famous marksmen what shall we say then but the story of this bold master shot was primeval amongst many tribes and races and that it only crystallized itself round the great name of tell by that process of attraction which invariably leads a grateful people to throw such mythic wreaths such garlands of bold deeds of precious memory found round the brow of its darting champion nor let any pious welshman be shocked if we venture to assert that gellert the famous hound upon whose last resting place the traveller comes as he passes down the lovely vale of granant 
is a mythical dog and never snuffed the fresh breeze in the forest of Snowdon, nor saved his master's child from ravening wolf. This too is a primeval story told with many variations. Sometimes the foe is a wolf, sometimes a bear, sometimes a snake, sometimes the faithful guardian of the child is an otter, a weasel, or a dog. It too came from the east. It is found in the Tantra, in the Hitobedesia, in Bitpas fables, in the Arabic original of the Seven Wise Masters, that famous collection of stories which illustrate a stepdame's calumny and hate and in many medieval versions of those originals. Thence it passed into the Latin gesta Romanonum, where, as well as in the old English version, published by Sir Frederick Madden, it may be read as a service rendered by a faithful hound against a snake. This too, like tells Master Shot, is as the lightning which shineth over the whole heaven at once, and can be claimed by no one tribe of the Aryan race, to the exclusion of the rest. The dog of Montages is in like manner mythic, though perhaps not so widely spread. It first occurs in France, as told of Sibylla, a fabulous wife of Charlemagne, but it is at any rate as old as the time of Plutarch, who relates it as an anecdote of brute sagacity in the days of Pythus. There can be no doubt with regard to the question of the origin of these tales, that they were common in gem, at least to the Aryan tribes, before their migration. We find those gems developed in the popular traditions of the Eastern Aryans, and we find them developed in a hundred forms and shapes in every one of the nations into which the Western Aryans have shaped themselves in the course of ages. We are led, therefore, irresistibly to the conclusion that these traditions are as much a portion of the common inheritance of our ancestors as their language unquestionably is, and that they form, along with that language, a double chain of evidence, which proves their eastern origin. If we are to seek for a simile or an analogy as to the relative positions of these tales and traditions, and to the mutual resemblances which exist between them as the several branches of our race have developed them from the common stock, we may find it in one which will come home to every reader as he looks round the domestic hearth, if he should be so happy as to have one. They are like as sisters of one house alike. They have what would be called a strong family likeness, but besides this likeness, which they owe to father or mother, as the case may be, they have each their peculiarities of form, and eye, and face, and still more, their differences of intellect and mind. This may be dark, that fair, this may have grey eyes, that black, this may be open and graceful, that reserved and close. This you may love, and that you can take no interest in. One may be bashful, another winning, a third worth knowing and yet hard to know. They are so like and so unlike. At first it may be, as an old English writer beautifully expressed it, their father hath wit, their father hath writ them as his own little story, but as they grow up they throw off the copy, educate themselves for good or ill, 
and finally assume new forms of feeling and feature under an original development of their own. Or shall we take another likeness and say they are national dreams, that they are like the sleeping thoughts of many men upon one and the same thing? Suppose a hundred men to have been eyewitness of some event on the same day, and then to have slept and dreamed of it, we should have as many distinct representations of that event, all turning upon it and bound up with it in some way, but each preserving the personality of the sleeper and working up the common stuff in a higher or lower degree, just as the fancy and the intellect of the sleeper was at a higher or lower level of perfection. There is indeed greater truth in this likeness than may at first sight appear. In the popular tale, properly so called, the national mind dreams all its history over again. In its half-conscious state, it takes this trait and that trait, this feature and that feature of times and ages long past. It snatches up bits of the old beliefs and fears, and griefs, and glory, and pieces them together with something that happened yesterday, and then holds up the discarded reflection in all its inconsequence, just as it has passed before that magic glass, as though it were genuine history, and matter for pure belief. And here it may be as well to say that besides that old classical foe of vermicular tradition, there is another hardly less dangerous which returns to the charge of copying, but changes what lawyers call the venue of the trial from classical to eastern lands. According to this theory, which came up when its classical predecessor was no longer tenable, the traditions and tales of Western Europe came from the East, but they were still all copies. They were supposed to have proceeded entirely from two sources. One, the Directorium Humanae Vitae of John of Capua, which again came from an Arabic version of the 8th century, which came from a Pahivi version made by one Basuye at the command of Chosro Noshivan, king of Persia in the 6th century, which again came from the Pancha Tantra, a Sanskrit original of unknown antiquity. This is that famous book of Kalila and Dimna, as the Persian version is called attributed to Bitbai, and which was thus run to earth in India. The second source of Western tradition was held to be that still more famous collection of stories commonly known by the name of the Story of the Seven Sages, but which, under many names, Kaiser Octavianus, Diocletianus, Doropathus, Eurastus, etc., plays a most important part in medieval romance. This too, by a similar process, has been traced to India, appearing first in Europe at the beginning of the 13th century in the Latin Historia Septum Sapientum Romae by Dame Jehans, monk in the Abbey of Hautself. Here too, we have a Hebrew, an Arabic, and a Persian version, which last came avowedly from a Sanskrit original, though that original has not yet been discovered. From these two sources of fable and tradition, according to the new copying theory, our Western fables and tales had come by direct translation from the East. Now it will be at once evident that this theory 
hangs on what may be called a single thread. Let us say, then, that all that can be found in Kalila and Dimna, or the later Persian version made A.D. 1494 of Hossein Weir's called the Anvari Sohali, the canopic lights from which, when published in Paris by David Said of Ispahan in the year 1644, La Fontaine drew the substance of many of his best fables. Let us say, too, that all can be found in the Life of the Seven Sages, or the Book of Sandabad, as it was called in Persia, after an apocryphal Indian sage came by translation, that is to say, through the cells of Brahmins, Magians, and monks, and the labors of the learned into the popular literature of the west let us give up all that and then see where we stand what are we to say of the many tales and fables which are to be found in neither of those famous collections and not tales alone but traits and features of old tradition broken bits of fable roots and gems of mighty growths of song and story, nay, even the very words which exist in Western popular literature and which modern philosophy has found obstinately sticking in Sanskrit, and of which fresh proofs and instances are discovered every day? What are we to say of such a remarkable resemblance as this? The noble king Patraka fled into the Vindhya mountains in order to live apart from his unkind kinsfolk. And as he wandered about there, he met two men who wrestled and fought with one another. Who are you? he asked. We are the sons of Meyasara, and here lie our riches. This bow this staff and these shoes. These are what we are fighting for, and whichever is stronger is to have them for his own. So when Petraka had heard that, he asked them with a laugh, Why, what's the good of owing these things? Then they answered, Whoever puts on these shoes gets the power to fry, Whatever is pointed at with this staff rises up at once, and whatever food one wishes for in this bowl, it comes at once. So when Petraka had heard that, he said, Why fight about it? Let this be the prize. Whoever beats the other in a race, let him have them all. So be it, said the two fools, and set off running. But Patraka put on the shoes at once and flew away with the staff and bow up into the clouds. Well, this is a story neither in the Pantra Tantra nor the Hitopadisa, the Sanskrit originals of Kalila and Dimna. It is not in the Directorum Humanae Vitae and has not passed west by that way. Nor is it in the book of Sindabad, and thence come west in the history of the seven sages. Both these paths are stopped. It comes from the Katha Saint Sagara, the sea of streams of story of Samadeva Prata of Kashmir, who in the middle of the twelfth century of our era worked up the tales found in an earlier collection called the Rika Katna, the lengthened story, in order to amuse his mistress, the Queen of Kashmir. Somadeva's collection has only been recently known and translated, but West the story certainly came long before, and in the extreme Northwest, we still find it in these Norse tales in the three 
Princesses of Whiteland, number 26. Well, said the man, as this is so, I will give you a bit of advice. Hereabouts on a moor stand three brothers, and there they have stood these hundred years, fighting about a hat, a clock, and a pair of boots in. If anyone has these three things, he can make himself invisible, and wish himself anywhere he pleases. You can tell them you wish to fly the things, and after that you will pass judgment between them whose they shall be. Yes, the king thanked the man, and went, and did as he told him. What's all this? he said to the brothers. Why you stand fighting forever and a day? Just let me try these things, and I'll give judgment whose they shall be. They were very willing to do this, but as soon as he had got the hat, clock, and boots, he said, When we meet next time, I'll tell you my judgment. And with these words, he wished himself away. Nor in the Norse tales alone, other collections showed how thoroughly at home this story was in the East. In the relations of Sidi Kerr, a Tata tale, a Chen's son first gets possession of a clock which two children stand and fight for, which has the gift of making the wearer invisible, and afterwards of a pair of boots with which one can wish one's self to whatever place one chooses. Again, in a Valachian tale, we read of three devils who fight for their inheritance, a club which turns everything to stone, a hat which makes the wearer invisible, and a clock by help of which one can wish one's self whichever one pleases. Again, in a Mongolian tale, the Chan's son comes upon a group of children who fight for a hood which makes the wearer invisible. He is to be judged between them, makes them run a race for it, but meanwhile puts it on and vanishes from their sight. A little further on, he meets another group who are quarreling for a pair of boots, the wearer of which can wish himself whichever he pleases, and gains possession of them in the same way. Nor in one Norse tale alone, but in many, we find traces of these three wonderful things, or of things like them. They are very like the cloth, the ram, and the stick, which the lad got from the north wind instead of his meal. Very like, too, the cloth, the scissors, and the tap, which will be found in number 26. The best wish. If we drop the number 3, we find the boots again in Soria Maria Castle, number 61. Leaving the Norse tales, we see at once that they are the seven league boots of Jack the Giant Killer. In the Nibelungen Light when Siegfried finds Shibang and Nippang, the weird heirs of the famous horde, striving for the possession of that heap of red gold and grimming stories, when they beg him to share it for them, promising them as his meat, Balamunk, best of swords, when he shares it, when they are discontent, and when in the struggle which ensues, he gets possession of the Tarnhut, the clock of darkness, which gave his wearer the strength of twelve men, and enabled him to go where he would be unseen, and which was the great prize among the treasures of the dwarfs. Who is there that does not see the broken fragments of that old eastern story of the heirs struggling for their inheritance and calling in the aid of someone of better wit or strength who ends by making the very price for which they fight his own and now to return for a moment to kalila and dimna 
and the seven sages since we have seen that there are other stories and many of them for this is by no means the only resemblance to be found in some nativist book which are common to the eastern and western aryans but which did not travel to europe by translation let us go on to say that it is by no means certain even when some western stories or fable is found in these Sanskrit originals and their translations that that was the only way by which they came to europe a single question will prove this how did the fables and epilogues which are found in aesop and which are also found in the panchatanya and the hitopitisha come west that they came from the east is certain but by what way certainly not by translation or copying for they had travelled west long before translations were thought of how was it that themistius greek orator of the fourth century had heard of that fable of the lion fox and bull which is in substance the same as that of the lion the bull and the two jackals in the pancha tanja and the hitopidisha how but along the path of that primitive aryan migration and by that deep ground tone of tradition by which man speaks to man nation to nation and age to age along which comparative philosophy has in these last days travelled back thither listen to the accents spoken and so found the east the cradle of a common language and common belief and now having as we hope finally established this indian affinity and disposed of mere indian copying let us lift our eyes and see if something more is not to be discerned on the wide horizon now open on our view the most interesting problem for man to solve is the origin of his race of late years comparative philosophy having accomplished her task in proving the affinity of language between europe and the east and so taken a mighty step towards fixing the first seat of the greatest in wit and wisdom if not in actual numbers portion of the human race has pursued her inquiries into the languages of the tyrannian the semitic and the chemitic or african races with more or less successful results in a few more years when the african languages are better known and the roots of egyptian and chinese words are more accurately detected science will be better able to speak as to the common affinity of all the tribes that that throng the earth in the meantime let the testimony of tradition and popular tales be heard which in this case have outstripped comparative philosophy and lead instead of following her it is beyond the scope of this essay which aims at being popular and readable rather than learned and lengthy to go over a prolonged scientific investigation step by step we repeat it the reader must have faith in the writer and believe the words now written are the results of an inquiry and not as for the inquiry itself in all mythologies and traditions then there are what may be called natural resemblances parallelisms suggested to the senses of each race by natural objects and 
everyday events, and these might spring up spontaneously all over the earth as homegrowns, neither derived by imitation from other tribes nor from seeds of common tradition shared from a common stock. Such resemblances have been well compared by William Grimm to those words which are found in all languages, derived from the imitation of natural sounds, or, we may add, from the first lisping accents of infancy. But the case is very different when this or that object which strikes the senses is account for in a way so extraordinary and peculiar as to stamp the tradition with a character of its own. Then arises a like impression on the mind. If we find the same tradition in two tribes at the opposite ends of the earth, as is produced by meeting twin brothers, one in Africa and the other in Asia, we say at once, I know you are so-and-so's brother, you are so like him. Take an instance in these Norse tales, number 23. We are told how it was the bear came to have a stumpy tail, and in an African tale we find how it was the hyena became tailness and earness. Now this tailness condition both of the bear and the hyena could scarcely fail to attract attention in a race of hunters, and we might expect that popular tradition would attempt to account for both, but how are we to explain the fact that both Norsemen and African account of it in the same way, that both owe their laws to the superior cunning of another animal? In Europe, the fox bears away the palm for wit from all other animals, so he it is that persuades the bear in the Norse tales to sit with his tail in a hole in the ice till it is fast frozen in, and snaps short off when he tries to tuck it out. In Bornau, in the heart of Africa, it is the weasel who is the wisest of beasts, and who, having got some meat in common with the hyena, put it into a hole, and said, Behold, two men came out of the forest, took the meat, and put it into the hole. Stop, I will go into the hole, and then thou mayst stretch out thy tail to me, and I will tie the meat to thy tail for thee to draw it out. So the weasel went into the hole, the hyena stretched its tail out to it, but the weasel took the hyena's tail, fastened a stick, and tied the hyena's tail to the stick, and then said to the hyena, I have tied the meat to thy tail, draw and pull it out. The hyena was a fool. It did not know the weasel surpassed it in subtly. It thought the meat was tied, but when it tried to draw out its tail, it was fast. When the weasel said again to it, pull, it pulled, but could not draw it out, so it became vexed and on pulling with force, his tail broke. The tail being torn out, the weasel was no more seen by the hyena. The weasel was hidden in the hole with its meat, and the hyena saw it not. Here we have a fact in natural history account for, but 
account for in such a peculiar way as shows that the races among which we are current must have derived them from some common tradition. The mode by which the tale is lost is different indeed, but the manner in which the common groundwork is suited in one case to the cold of the north and the way in which fish are commonly caught at holes in the ice as they rise to beef and in the other to africa and her pitfalls for wild beasts is only another proof of the oldness of the tradition and that it is not merely a copy take another instance everyone knows the story in the arabian nights where the man who knows the speech of beasts laughs at something said by an ox to an ass his wife wants to know why he laughs and persists so he tells her it will cost him his life if he tells her as he doubts what to do he hears the cock said to the house dog our master is not wise i have fifty hands who obey me if he followed my advice he'd just take a good stick shut up his wife in a room with him and give her a good cudgeling the same story is told in straparola with so many variations as to show it is no copy it is also told in a servian popular tale with variations of its own and now here we find it in bernau as told by ko there was a servant of god who had one wife and one horse but his wife was one-eyed and they lived in their house now this servant of god understood the language of the beasts of the forest when they spoke and of the birds of the air when they talked as they flew by this servant of god also understood the city of the hyena when it arose at night in the forest and came to the houses and cried near them so likewise when the horse was hungry and neighed he understood why it neighed and rose up brought the horse grass and then returned and sat down it happened one day that birds had their talk as they were flying by above and the servant of god understood what they talked this caused him to laugh whereupon his wife said to him what dost thou what dost thou hear that thou laughest he replied to his wife i shall not tell thee what i hear and why i laugh the woman said to her husband i know why thou laughest thou laughest at me because i am one-eyed the man then said to his wife i saw that thou wast one-eyed before i loved thee and before we married and sat down in our house when the woman heard her husband's word she was quiet but once at night as they were lying on the bed and it was past midnight it happened that a rat played with his wife on the top of the house and that both fell to the ground then the wife of the rat said to her husband thy sport is bad thou says to me that thou wouldst pay but when we came together we fell to the ground so that i broke my back when the servant of god heard the talk of the rat's wife as he was lying on his bed he laughed now as soon as he laughed his wife arose seized him and said to him as she held him fast 
Now, this time, I will not let thee go out of this house, except thou tell me what thou hearest and why thou laughest. The man begged the woman, saying, Let me go. But the woman would not listen to her husband's entreaty. The husband then tells his wife that he knows the language of beasts and birds, and she is content. But when he wakes in the morning, he finds he has lost his wonderful gift, and the moral of the tale is added most ungallantly. If a man shows and tells his thoughts to a woman, God will punish him for it, though perhaps it is better for the sake of the gentler sex that the tale should be pointed with unfair moral than that the African story should proceed like all the other variations and save the husband's gift at the cost of the wife's skin. Take other African instances. How is it that the wandering Bahunas got the story of the two brothers, the groundwork of which is the same as the Machantabung and the Milk White Do, and where the incidents and the and and even the words are almost the same. How is it that in some of these traits that Bechuana's story has embodied those of that earliest of all popular tales, recently published from an Egyptian papyrus, coeval with the abode of the Israelites in Egypt? And how is it that that same Egyptian tale has other traits which reminds us of the dun bull in Katie Wooden Clock, as well as incidents which are the gem of stories long since reduced to writing in Norse sagas of the 12th and 13th centuries? How is it that we still find among the Negroes in the West Indies a rich story of popular tales, and the bees epic in full bloom brought with them from Africa to the islands of the West, and among those tales and traditions, how is it that we find a wishing tree, the counterpart of that in a German popular tale, and a little dirty scrub of a child whom his sister despised, but who is own brother to Boots in the Norse tales, and like him always the troll, spoils his substance and saves his sister? How is it that we find the good woman who washes the loathsome head rewarded while the bad man who refuses to do that dirty work is punished for his pride. The very groundwork, nay, the very worst that we meet in Bushy Bride, another Norse tale, how is it that we find a Mongolian tale which came confessedly from India, made up of two of our Norse tales, Rich Peter the Peddler, and the giant that had no heart in his body. How should all these things be? And how could they possibly be, except on that theory, which day by day becomes more and more of a matter of fact? This, that the whole human race sprung from one stock, planted in the east, which has stretched out its boughs and branches, laden with the fruit of language, and bright with the bloom of song and story, by successive offshoots to the utmost parts of the earth. 
End of section four. Recording by Andy Yu, Mississauga, Canada.